Welcome to our series of Healthcare Scene Interviews, where we sit down with top leaders in healthcare IT. I'm John Lynn, the founder of healthcarescene.com, a network of leading healthcare IT resources. We just passed 11,000 blog posts over 11 years, which is a lot of content. I like to say there's nothing we haven't written about, but if you have something that we haven't, let us know. Anyways, check it out at healthcarescene.com. Before we begin with our interview today, we're talking Alexa Healthcare. Yes. But uh, before we begin, I want to remind those watching live that uh, we'll talk for about 30 minutes and then we'll open up for questions from the audience. If you're watching on YouTube live, then you can ask your questions in the comments. I think it's in the upper right corner for if you're watching on YouTube. Uh, and you can add your comments in the chat box. We'll do our best to incorporate them either during the interview if they fit in or at the end. So please send those our way. All right, enough with logistics. Our special guest today is Nate Trelor, President and CEO of Orbita. Welcome, Nate. Thank you, John, and congratulations on your big content milestone. That's a lot of content. <laughs> yeah, sometimes it surprises me that, uh, you know, anyway, beauty of uh, time. Time, time uh, solves a lot of stuff. A anyways, uh, tell us about yourself, Nate, and, uh, and tell us about Orbita. Sure. Uh, well, first of all, thank you for the opportunity to have this conversation. I'm really looking forward to it. So um, my name is Nate Trelor. As John mentioned, I'm president and CEO of Orbita. We're a software company based out of Boston, uh, focused on connected healthcare, driving uh, connected connectivity to patients at home and being able to connect them to their care providers, both clinical care providers and family and friend care providers through innovative connected care solutions. Excellent. So, you know, I, today we're talking about Alexa, but I think in more broadly, we're talking about voice assistant technology, which I think Alexa's kind of changed the game there. So tell our people watching, where are we at today with this voice assistant technology and where did we come from? What's been the evolution? Yeah, well, the idea of voice assistants and voice assistant technology is not a new one. Um, most of us have some familiarity with using interactive voice response systems, calling your cable company, for example, and being put into a menu of voice response uh, um, interaction. So that, I, that concept and that technology is not new. And then, of course, when Apple came out with Siri, I think in 2010, if I remember right, it created a new kind of experience for mobile phone users to be able to interact with services and content on their phone through the power of voice. Uh, kind of flash forwarding to um, 2015, I think it was, maybe late 2014, when Amazon produced the Echo, this new physical device with a voice assistant technology built into it. It kind of changed the game a little bit. It created a form factor for an always-on uh, voice assistant that could be in your home, in this case, and uh, basically provide you access to content and services that um, may have been otherwise not as easily accessible, even with the tooling of something like Siri. So in our opinion, um, Amazon has really kind of changed the market a bit in voice assistant technology. I think the other thing to point out is it's just gotten better. Um, voice recognition itself has gotten better. And part of that is this whole big data world that uh, Google and Amazon and Microsoft and Apple all talk about. They have access to volumes of information through the other channels of the web and mobile worlds that allows them to build very, um, very smart language models to be able to recognize what people are saying and be able to handle varying context. So that, that has changed quite a lot, even just in the last two years. I, I don't know if uh, the folks online use Siri to do texting, um, as an example, or, or Google's equivalent, Google Now, um, it's gotten a lot better. I, I use um, the voice assistant on my phone almost exclusively when I'm doing texting, just because it's faster for me. Um, and um, I, I'm probably an exception to this day, but I think we'll see that kind of interaction and voice interfaces becoming more prevalent as the technology becomes more accessible and better. Mm. No, it's been interesting. I mean, we're huge Alexa fans in our house. In fact, I, I like to say my kids fight over Alexa. They don't fight over the remote. I, I don't even think they know what a remote is, right? I, I remember one day when my son asked Alexa to play a song, and Alexa said, I don't have it. And he was like, what? He was, like, confused. Yeah. Yeah. Because every other time he's asked for a song, Alexa's answer. So I think you're right. That evolution of what Alexa knows and what Alexa can do and how well they understand has come a long way. But I think you highlighted the other point that I think is probably key to this evolution 
which is that it's always on and always there available to you. In fact, yeah. I was up in my, my bedroom the other day and I wanted to tell Alexa something. I was really upset that she was all the way downstairs. I'm like, oh, I guess I got to get another one. But uh, you know, it becomes that, that type of, you want that always on interaction and ability for them to be able to answer you. Is that what makes it different? Is that what makes it special? Yeah, I think it's certainly part of it. Um, it's also the fact that behind the this device is a whole set of services and, and information that um, you can access through the power of your own voice. But certainly the form factor has a lot to do with it. Um, the other thing that I think makes a difference is um, the, the fact that it has um, sort of more of an, a, a conversational model built into it. And what I mean by that, if you think about how you use the web or how you use other devices, um, it's usually very transactional. I, I want to find a web page. I want to look up uh, a definition of a word. Um, what we see with these voice experiences is that there's an opportunity to create a more conversational engagement. Um, so if somebody says, for example, in a healthcare context, it's to kind of bring it back to this call, um, I'm in pain. Um, you know, what's the response? What does a voice assistant say if somebody says I'm in pain? And it depends on the context. It depends on the, you know, the, the condition of the patient in this case. Um, it depends on maybe time of day and what you might know about medication they're taking. And when we look at these voice experiences, we, we, we think that the real opportunity is how do you create a level of engagement that empowers an individual to um, be more in control of their world if they're in a, in, in a healthcare situation, maybe be more in control of their own, their own wellness through these conversational models. And I think that has a big part to do with it. I think we're very early in respect to um, how voice assistants are gonna evolve from just play a song, check the weather, that type of thing. But where we are trying to be is sort of in front of that and we're working with our customers specifically around how to empower those type of experiences. Nice. I mean, you, you covered so many things that are that are interesting, not the least of which we haven't even mentioned security, which is probably, you know, the always on is a, is a fear for yeah. many of these. You know, maybe we could talk about that later, but, you know, I, I think it's also interesting. It, it has so much data behind it and so many, in, in Alexa's case, skills that it's enabling. But, you know, as part of it, you, you also have the disabled function, right? Like when I first started Alexa, I could say play the songs in random order, and she would. And I don't know whatever update they did in the background, but now she doesn't do random order for me. So it's going to be interesting to see that evolution of the product. Yeah. Uh, and then going back to what you said, the, also the context. I think right now, you're right, it's way early for Alexa. She doesn't know context. So even when I start playing my playlist, I say skip 10 songs. Uh, she doesn't understand that 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 context and doesn't understand you know <laughs> some of those things. So. Yeah, I, I, I'm excited about that, but I think we have, I think you're right. It's still very early, and if you apply that to healthcare, it gets even more complex, right? Yeah, yeah, it gets more complex, and there are aspects of these voice assistants in healthcare and in other situations, but we'll focus on healthcare, of course, that are uh, that make these voice assistants um, even more compelling. Uh, one example that was some, one that somebody gave to me, they have a, a, an, an aging uh, in-law who has uh, dementia. And one of, the sad, uh, one of the sad aspects of dementia, it's not uncommon for somebody with dementia to ask, what day is today? Or what do I have on my calendar today? What am I supposed to do? And repeatedly ask that question. And if you're the spouse of that individual and they're asking you what day is today every five minutes, it's, it's hard not to get frustrated. And if you snap back, the, the, you know, which of course would be a bad thing to do for the individual, the patient, um, their, their reaction is, oh my God, I'm going crazy. I, and I have an anxiety manifest. Well, guess what? Alexa never gets impatient. <laughs> and um, it's actually a kind of a cognitive touch point for a patient with dementia to be able to ask that question. And it actually builds a sense of calm as we've experienced with uh, this one, one case. So um, there are aspects of this sort of non-egotistical voice assistant of Alexa or Google Assistant that can also transform 
how people are cared for in their home. And that's something we've just learned. In the, you know, I would say my team here at Orbit, I would just learn in the last few months that it is a different kind of experience when you're dealing with a virtual assistant than when you're dealing with a human. Hmm. That's great. It's the spouse we all want to be patient. Oh, you know, <laughs> listens and doesn't mind uh, if you make mistakes. Uh, are there other examples in healthcare? I mean, I, that's a great one. Uh, you know, with kind of the the uh, Alzheimer's patients or you know people with dementia. Any, any other examples that you see cropping up in yeah. healthcare? There, there are a few kind of patterns that have emerged around sort of what works well in a voice assistant um, model. One of them is just um, you know recording uh, medication or recording treatment in order to kind of track adherence. You know, medication adherence, treatment adherence is a big deal for people who are being cared for at home. And there are literally billions being spent and invested in trying to solve the problem of medication adherence for individuals with various chronic illnesses at home. So uh, one of the simplest things you can do with a voice assistant is allow somebody to just keep track of the fact that they took their medicine um, and also to check whether they took their medicine. So you can say, you know, Alexa, did I take my medicine today? Mm -hmm. And being able to record that information. However, it was actually recorded in the first place, whether it was using a smart pill box or just somebody using a smartphone app, be able through the power of voice just to confirm that and ask that question is one. Um, and it doesn't have to be just medication, you know, just how many steps did I walk today? You know, if I'm a coming out of a joint replacement, I'm expected to be somewhat active and being able to keep track of that and be able to do it just to kind of as a check through voice is powerful. The other one is um, coordinating care. So um, one of the projects we're working on right now with a regional care provider in the Boston area is um, for patients with chronic care needs at home to be able to manage their personal care attendance schedules. Say I need somebody to come by and um, uh, you know, help me take a bath at 9.30 tomorrow morning, or I just need somebody to come in and check on me. Um, to be able to manage that through the power of voice and have confirmation come back and say, you know, Joe is gonna come by and check in on you at, at 9.30. Um, what it does is it gives the patient more control over that scheduling, but also it takes a little bit of the burden off the healthcare system because they're not having to have to staff a lot of people. In that case, the voice assistant becomes a proxy for a human intervention, but it also can relax to that human intervention. We don't think a voice assistant is the end game. It's an assistant, a proxy for established systems for care and care attendance scheduling. Excellent. I love those examples. And uh, I think there's a power in being able to do it because anyone could do it because uh, even seniors that don't have smartphones or, you know, that aren't as tech savvy, they can talk to it, right? Yeah, it's not, you know, to be clear, it's not for everybody. Um, you need to be able to talk if you have aphasia or some other condition. Fair it's enough. not going to work. Or if you're hearing impaired, sure. um, it's not ideal. Um, but um, it is an example of a, a user experience for patients at home that we think can be quite powerful and is quite powerful and compelling. And combining that with other kinds of connected uh, technology, um, you create a more complete experience and uh, like we said it's not the, the be all and end all but it is a it is a powerful tool and a powerful new tool that we think should be brought into the uh, patient care experience nice and we want to talk about that but before we do that let, can we show a demo to the people watching of, of seeing it <clears throat> those that aren't yeah. familiar with alexa maybe show some examples and the response yeah. if you're not familiar with um alexa alexa is the software and the physical device is called the Echo. This is one from Amazon. This one is the small one. It's called an Echo Dot. And uh, I got a larger one over here. This is the, uh, the, the original one that came out. kind of looks like a Pringles can. And uh, it's basically a large speaker with some controls on the top. You control the volume by twisting this. The newer ones have buttons, which I think actually is a, a setback. I think the uh, twisting it was a better feature. The reason I say that is because if you're vision impaired, it's harder to find the buttons. Yeah, and nice. we, I have a friend who's vision impaired and he prefers this. But anyway, this is the big Pringles can. Um, it's got microphones embedded in it around the top. I think it's six or eight microphones that it allows it to kind of recognize what's being spoken and from where in the room it's being spoken. So it can kind of direct the conversation uh, spatially. But the little guy here, um, is the dot and I'm gonna it's right now it's red because it's I've got same thing more or less but just without as good of a speaker 
Right, it doesn't have that big speaker. Um, it has a speaker in it, you'll hear it in a second, but it's also got a little jack so you can plug it into your stereo system. Okay. Um, so they got some complaints when they first uh, announced this that um, people wanted to hook it into their, into their stereo systems. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn it on and we'll just do a little uh, example here. Alexa, what's the weather today? In Boston, there's a winter storm warning in effect until Thursday, February 9th. 8 p.m. The current weather is 27 in Boston. <laughs> Today's forecast calls for more of the same, with a high of 32 degrees and a Alexa, low of 11 degrees. Cancel. So we're in the middle of a winter storm. If I could show you the foot and a half of snow outside, um, I can <laughs> confirm that it is snowing. Um, so that's a very simple example, and it's one that kind of comes out of the box with Alexa and the Echo device. Um, so you just heard me say her name. <laughs> I lit up blue because I said her name. Yep. Um, important point there. Um, that's a concept of what uh, Amazon calls the wake word. When you say Alexa, um, she wakes up and listens for the next command. Um, I muted it because if I say Alexa, I'm going to wake her up. And it's a little bit of a liability. Um, and it's just one of the aspects of these voice assistants. It's sort of like saying Siri, waking up Siri on your phone, the same idea. Um, there are a lot of, there's a lot of interest in being able to have these kind of devices that can just um, answer to a name that you give it. Like if you wanted to call it John, why not? Or Billy. Um, and we expect that technology, Amazon will evolve it and that kind of flexibility will be more common. Um, mm -hmm. What we've done and what we're doing with our customers is you can extend Alexa. Um, you mentioned this word skill. So on your smartphone, you have apps. On Alexa, you have skills. And what a skill is, a particular voice experience that's geared towards a particular need. So there's a skill for ordering a pizza from Domino's. I'm not going to do that, but you could do that. <laughs> I could order a pizza if I had it set up. There's a skill for playing Jeopardy. There's a skill for um, um, getting information from um, um, the Boston Children's Hospital for your kid's health. There's ex many examples like that. Um, but we've created a skill that um, essentially is a general purpose skill for managing patients in the home healthcare setting. So an example would be um, if I want to report um, um, a, a healthcare vital, our skill is called Heather. So I can say, Alexa, tell Heather my blood pressure is 120 over 80. You said your blood pressure is 120 over 80. Is that correct? Yes. Logged it. So she just logs it. And um, in fact, it gets, it gets logged to an application. Um, in our case, we're, uh, we're using our own application for, um, um, for um, caregiver coordination. Might be a little hard to see, but you can see that little message on the very top, blood pressure 120 over 80. That just came in just now. So again, there are a lot of different ways of exposing these applications. What we think is the power of, of the voice is for somebody being cared for at home, that kind of information can be captured, shared with their clinician, shared with their caregivers, and they can react and intervene when some problem might be uh, showing up. One of many, many possible examples. Sure. Um, and I love the integration, and that's integrated with your app, right? So yeah. you, you know, they're, they're giving that, and then, of course, that can be seen through the web. That can be seen through a mobile app. Yeah. Cue off notifications, emails, any sort of interaction, but all cued that's from nice. the voice. It can't go backwards to Alexa, right? I don't think you can push that way yet. Is that well, true? That's a, that's a good question, um, and when we get off, and I would say that the, the idea of being able to push a, a reminder, for example, to this device um, so that you could say to mom first thing in the morning, uh, good morning, it's 9.30, it's time to take your Coumadin. Um, that feature is not available in this particular device. Um, Amazon does not allow you to push proactively uh, a message. The only way they can do that right now is through a reminder facility that, uh, that plays a little chime. So yeah. you, you can set a reminder, I can do it right now. Alexa, five minutes. I've added five minutes to your to-do list. That's not exactly what I wanted it to do, but uh, you'll get the point. I just said it wrong. That's um, actually better because it will start chiming in. It yeah, just I what I want to do is <laughs> but, uh, you get the idea. I just yep. said it wrong. Um, in five minutes, a little chime will come off. But what we can't do is you can't push a message to that. We expect that that's going to change as well. Um, we've heard from Amazon that that's one of the top requests that they've gotten for Alexa is to be able to 
proactively push little reminders, custom reminders, either through a skill or through the native interface. So it's not there right now, but it's possible. I will also mention quickly that um, if you're using uh, an Alexa powered device, Alexa can, can run on uh, other hardware. It doesn't have to be the Echo. Um, so if you run it on other hardware, you do, as a developer, you have control over being able to do those sort of things. And there are people experimenting with that. Interesting. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, I think our TV will have Alexa. I know people who use Alexa through their TV, which already has speakers, has an interface. And so that's right. anything you can do it through that. You know, I've seen even at CES, I saw someone who created essentially a smart uh, uh, environmental control system on yeah. an iPad. Or or a or an Android tablet. It's like once you have that, you could put Alexa on that, no problem, right? <laughs> That's right. Yeah. What's interesting, you mentioned the Consumer Electronics Show a month ago. Uh, one of the most frequently mentioned concepts at that show was the Alexa, and uh, Amazon had no formal presence at the show, but they were everywhere. And the reason they were everywhere is because there were a lot of hardware vendors that were embedding the Alexa voice assistant technology into their hardware from Ford Motor Company to the company you mentioned. Um, and it's a pretty smart idea on the part of Amazon. Really, their proposition is not physical devices. It's the services that sit behind it. Yep. That's great. And actually, that goes to our next, the next uh, discussion I want to have with you because you know, I think it's great that you're working to enable caregivers to be able to get access to home health information and to engage with patients that way. But obviously, there's, you know, the thing that excited me when I met you first time, I think at Connected Health Symposium, was that you created a tool, almost a, you know, really a, a workflow engine for yeah. other people to create Alexa skills. So, right. you know, I think there's a, probably a lot of people that are going to watch this or that are listening now live that are like, oh, I could use this in my organization. I should tell my developer. And the developer is going to be like, how do I do an Alexa skill? So, you know, tell us about what you've built yeah. and how, you know, any, you know, an EHR vendor, a, you know, any of these mobile health companies that maybe want the Alexa skill but don't want to build the entire infrastructure, yeah. uh, tell, tell them what you've built for them because I think that is actually one of the most exciting things that Orbit is doing. Yeah, well, thanks. Um, yeah, so what we've discovered as um, we got into building our own Alexa skills is that Amazon provides a framework for building um, basic skills, but what they don't do is provide a framework um, first of all, that, that framework is, is, is pretty much raw code. You've got to be a software engineer to go in there and work with it. Um, and if you have some chops there, you can get in there and build basic skills. But if you really want to build um, a skill that has sort of the rich conversational model in the domain of healthcare, um, there's quite a lot of things that you have to do. And it, it, it very quickly becomes extremely burdensome to do it in a way that scales, that a way that's easy to maintain, a way that um, is secure, which we'll talk about. And uh, so what we built was a, essentially a, a voice experience manager and designer, which allows you um, in a really graphical way to design those conversation models um, in a way that's um, sensitive and aware of the kind of unique use cases that we have in healthcare and the unique information that comes from healthcare. The example I gave with blood pressure, right? So I said blood pressure is 120 over 80. Um, but um, what Amazon provides you is ability to recognize that blood pressure is a particular kind of word and those are two numbers and you can kind of take that information, but it doesn't help you decide whether 120 is a good number or a bad number. It doesn't help you decide whether in the context of this input, um, what to do with that information and how to connect it with a back-end system, whether it's an EHR or a scheduling system. So we built a framework, uh, what we call um, Orbit of Voice, and we're actually branding it as that, and you can see it on our website now. It allows um, developers, even non-technical people, to very quickly build these conversational models that work with Amazon Alexa, but also will work with Google Home. Mm -hmm. And will eventually, our plans are, they'll work with all the other voice assistant platforms. And the idea is the way we look at these technologies like a, uh, uh, Amazon Alexa is they are voice platforms that provide a framework for creating these experiences. But to get that last mile of capability, you need something more. And that's what we've built. Hmm. 
No, I, I think it's incredible. And I, I, when I first met you, I learned the history of the the company, or at least the founder of the company was a you know before this he built WYSIWYG editors for websites, yeah. which totally resonated for me because I don't remember how many websites where I built table after table and wanted to shoot myself right before the yeah. WYSIWYG editor would just do it for you. You'd say three columns, two rows, and it would just output it. I mean, you're essentially, if I as I see it trying to do that for voice assistant, it's not so much that you're making it so that anyone could build a skill, because I think there's still some some technical chops that is needed to work with you, but you're taking out the the complicated things, or not necessarily complicated, but the redundant things that just take a lot of time and making them yeah. easy to implement. Is that a fair description? Absolutely. Um, not to geek out too much, but um, you know where we where we think voice coming in is really it's it's part of this third wave of the internet. And as you pointed out, and if say the first wave was 15, 20 years ago, and everybody was scrambling to build a website, right? You needed to have a website. You needed to have a presence presence on the web. If you wanted to, if you were a healthcare or you know, a physician's office and you wanted to create a way to engage people digitally, you had a web website. So you went out and had somebody build you that website. And then you realize, all right, well, I need to get content on that website. I need to create a way for them to access their patient information securely. Um, and then mobile came around, the second wave. You need to do the same thing through mobile interface. You need to kind of go back and retrofit everything. We think voice is just another kind of uh, user experience with all the same challenges and opportunities that those first two waves um, represented. So as you pointed out, the founders of the company come from a background of what you might generally call um, digital experience management. And we think of voice as just another type of digital experience, but with the same, like I said, challenges and opportunities. So what we're trying to do is in our doing is applying what we've learned in the patterns of the first couple of waves of the internet say how can we bring the same facility flexibility and creating voice experiences um, that we brought to the first two waves now that's great and, and you know i think it's going to happen everywhere it's going to happen in our smart tvs it's going to happen in our phones it's going to happen in in a wide variety whether it's google home or alexa or siri or you know I mean, there's a lot of players there as well that yeah. Be interesting. yeah that's a it's um uh, it's interesting to look at the voice assistant marketplace. You mentioned most of the big guys, right? Of course, we talked about Alexa. We talked about Google's um, um, offering. It's called Google Assist or Google, sorry, Google Assistant. Mm -hmm. um, and it's gone through kind of Google's has gone through a few branding mm -hmm. uh, switches of Google Now and Google Assistant is more recent incarnation. Um, of course, we all know about Siri. Um, Microsoft has one called Cortana. Yep. Um, and in China, Baidu, Baidu has one, um, I can't remember what they call it, but they're huge in China and they're building their own voice assistant. And then, um, and then uh, Facebook is creating something called M, which hasn't been really announced, but it's sort of this hybrid voice assistant and a human assistant uh, model that they're rolling out. And uh, it's, as well, it's like right? browser wars, John. It's a little bit like the browser wars of between Netscape and Microsoft back in the day. Yep. And um, one of them will become more dominant. I think we, we believe Alexa has a big lead, but um, Google has, and Apple have quite a lot of power. It's going to be interesting to see how this plays out. I'd, I'd throw in Samsung as well, right? They, oh, right, yeah. I forgot Samsung, yeah. Uh, they're powerful. But, yeah, I mean, it, it's interesting. Uh, it's going to be interesting. Like you said, it's the battles. It's the it's the browser war battles. Um yeah, you know, I've even seen some head-to-heads with Google Home and Google and uh, Amazon Alexa, and seeing which one's better. And I think we're going to see a lot of that. But either way, I mean, the, to me, that the, this is the future, and it's going to happen. So let, let's finish with one last question, kind of going back to what I said before, because this is healthcare, and whenever we talk about like always on, and we talk about health information security, is just a huge issue, a huge concern, and many people are like, I don't want it. And we've had lots of interesting reports come out about Amazon Alexa. Oh, it's always listening, even when it's not responding. It's it's recording all of your data. And you know, I heard one person yeah. say, with whether it's true or not, they they uh, put something on their shopping list, and then they saw that ad on their on their email or something you know, on, when they were browsing the web. I don't think that was actually related. I think that was coincidence, but. This is the fear I think people have. Can we make Alexa secure? I mean, is that going to be 
a reasonable well, thing? Should we feel, was, feel comfortable? Frankly, it was probably a little bold of me to use the example I gave of, of, of sharing a you know healthcare vital through the voice experience. Um, uh -huh. But um, I guess there's there's a couple of ways to look at it. One is on the technology side. Um, I would say there's yeah you know, there's two ways to look at it. One on the technology side, how do you make sure that the information data that's being passed through a device like this from the mouth all the way up to where it ultimately ends up is as secure as it possibly can be. Um, on the back end and in all the um, kind of transports that happen between those bytes that are going up, um, it's very encrypted um, and very difficult to hack that if, if you know, practically impossible without whatever human uh, uh, loopholes exist. Um, most people point out that um, the always on part and the fact that if somebody walks into your room and your Alexa's on that you can speak to it. Yep. Uh, she will listen to anybody. Um, right now, Alexa doesn't have speaker identification. That concept does exist. It's a technical idea that it can recognize your voice and be able to confirm that you are who you are, kind of like a little thumbprint. Um, the accuracy of speaker recognition, like most technology, has gotten quite well, quite a bit better over the years. It's still not flawless. Um, but um, there are ways to kind of authenticate and authorize who the person speaking um, is. Now, by the same token, you can also walk into anybody's house, and if you're allowed in their house, they can pick up your phone and make a phone call to your cable provider, and the cable provider will identify who you are. Granted, it's not a healthcare example, but there are there's a bit of a precedence for this idea of um, ch channels of communication powered by voice. Um, where we see this evolving is, one, we think the technology will improve and is improving. What we've got in our own implementations is um, a requirement for the app to authenticate the user using a spoken PIN. Um, of course, if you speak the PIN out loud, anybody with an earshot can hear it. So there's that normal risk. Again, same with your telephone, right? You say your social security number over the phone, anybody with an earshot can hear it. Um, so it's, it's, this is not necessarily something where you put those kind of secure type of conversations into a public setting. Um, the other thing that we think um, ultimately will come forward is um, this concept that there, there are certain things that are going to make sense to do over the voice experience and some things that just won't make sense. Um, for example, as a, a voice assistant isn't necessarily in the very near term going to dispense medical um, uh, medical diagnosis or specific uh, prescriptive treatment. Uh, we think that that ultimately has to happen from a human for the for the near future. We kind of think of these as degrees of trust. I did when I did a presentation on this down in Denver, uh, excuse me, down in uh, D.C. Um, I basically laid it out, saying that out of the gate it'll be more kind of informational services, and these are the ones we're working on first. And, you know, tell me about these symptoms of diabetes. What are the examples of different kinds of medications that will treat the symptoms. And, and we're working with uh, partners to provide those sort of informational services through voice. The next level above that is really reporting of information, the example I gave. Beyond that is having it come back with information to say, you said your blood pressure was 150 over 130. 150 is above your acceptable level. We are going to escalate that to um, your care team so that they can take appropriate action. Those type of sort of um, kind of deterministic actions are sort of the level beyond. And then you can go all the way up to your voice assistant saying, um, you said your pain threshold is a nine on a scale of one to 10. Uh, we are dispensing through your automatic medication dispenser um, another uh, dose of medic uh, pain treatment. And uh, that, maybe we will get there, but that's, that's quite a bit in the future. Um, so we yeah. see as sort of these degrees, and we're going to see it evolve, um, and uh, some of these challenges of security be kind of checked off as we get through them. Sure. Well, and, and there's so much, you know, I mean, I think the key is we need to be an advocate for security because this is all evolving really quickly. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I would also say that, uh, you know, for those that are concerned about this information getting out, the, the insurance companies, the other people likely already have most of this information anyway. Uh, <laughs> they, they, they're getting it through other means, through your purchasing habits, through your credit card statements, through all sorts of things. And so, you know, while we think, you know, 
we're, well, we like this ignorance is bliss. They don't know about us. You know, this is one more method for them to get it. Uh, you know, so that, you know, there is some risk and we need to be careful and, and vigilant sure. and thoughtful in how we do it. But at the end of the day, I think the advantages that we're going to receive from this and the personalization and the improved health are going to be way more than the security risks. So That's a really great way to put it, John. I think you netted it out. Um, it's about balancing risk and, and benefits. And the example I give, again, it's probably to um, almost flippant in regard to the importance of healthcare is that we all kind of switched over to the, um, you know, getting rid of toll booths and using the easy pass, you know, just so we could say two, uh, 30 seconds of exchanging currency. Well, the fact is that now that we're using these uh, connected devices on our car to get through the toll booths quickly, they know where you are, they know when you're going through the booth. There's quite a lot of information that's being collected. But we're willing to give up a little bit of that information or all of that information in exchange for a little bit of convenience. Um, it's like I said, it may be an oversimplistic example, but um, we think that in time we're gonna we need to be very very careful about securing protected health information, about securing identity of, of, and and uh, secure, securing data across the board. But we're also working on a balance between these benefits and the um, and the risks associated. Yeah, and I know I'm on the far edge. You know, I've essentially assumed I don't have privacy. Uh, you know, I, I don't want to be crazy and wild, but uh, you know, anyways, I, I'm I'm way out there. I already know that. <laughs> anyways, uh, we're at our time. So, uh, real quick before we go, let it, let people know where they can learn more about Orbita. You're going to be at Hims as well, right? Uh, let That's them know right. where they can find more info. Yeah, we'll be at Hims in the connected experience area. Um, come on by. We'd love to get some visitors there. Um, we can also be found online at uh, www.orbitahealth.com, and uh, you can find us on Twitter and on Facebook and on LinkedIn as well. Excellent. Well, we'll see you at Hims, and thanks for joining us and sharing your experience on Alexa. If you like this content, check out more of these interviews at healthcarescene.com and plenty of blog posts and other content related to healthcare IT. We'll see you next time.